Well, hi guys, welcome to another AW um, interview. You've got James Ellington here. Now, James, if you don't know the story, it's an amazing story. So, you know, five PBs in 2016, um, was in the boom of his life. And then suddenly in 2017, was in Tenerife and had a huge motorbike um, crash. And James, I mean, the list is pretty long. I mean, fractured eye socket, mm. displaced pelvis, which is fractured, broken left ankle, fractured right tibia and fibula. You had lacerations all over, head, arms, legs. I think you described your leg, is it almost being like a bomb explosion that you thought you were kind of in yeah. a war zone? Like you were yeah, seeing yeah, yeah. blood all over the place. I mean... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. To, to, I guess to quickly go back to that, um, mm. you know, I mean, you've done loads of interviews about this. You've pretty talked mm. about this pretty more than most of the things in your life. But like, is there kind of one moment looking back where you think... I was lucky to be alive, or of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, pretty much after the as soon as the accident happened, that's all I was thinking. I thank God I'm alive. Um, and even in hospital, I was just thinking that was close. You know what I mean? So uh, I wasn't really taking the negatives out of the situation. I was thinking more of kind of like, right, I'm here. I could have been easily. I could have easily been dead. You know what I mean? So. Like, I mean, that was the warm weather training camp right out in Tenerife mm, at, at mm. that time with, with Nigel Levine, of course. Um, mm. Like, did you kind of, when you were out there, was there a feeling that, you know, that you would come back and, you know, your whole life by that stage had completely changed? I mean, you, mm. you talked about how, like, it was, you felt like you were being stabbed when, you were trying to walk and you couldn't walk mm. at least, you know, two and a half weeks after you would know mm. you're in a wheelchair for, for six weeks um, mm. and another six and crutches. I mean, mm -hmm. what was the, what was the crash like? And then what was that like compared to um, the recovery? I mean, was it in a sense, the recovery was yeah. almost harder than the crash? Yeah, I would say so. Um, obviously the crash, the crash was just crazy. So there's so much going on as well. And I was pretty much half out of it most of the time um, on machines and stuff like that. So you ain't even really got time to process anything then. Um, and obviously you've got everybody around you coming to see you and all the rest of it. So it's kind of, yeah, initially it's like, the it's, it's crazy. But I think the hardest thing for me was the comeback because once, once you're out of hospital and the hype's kind of died down and you don't really see anybody anymore and then you kind of left your own devices in your house, and you're in a wheelchair <laughs> and you're trying to come back from this. Um, yeah, it's crazy. It's obviously, I'm, a, I'm an athlete. I'm used to being, I'm used to training every day and being active. So to not actually be able to really move and uh, go through so much pain was, yeah, it was tough. And I mean, to this day, I still suffer from pains. I still get like pelvis pains and the rest of it, um, which I'm probably not going to be able to do anything about. I've just got to suck it up. But compared to what I went through earlier on with the pains, um, yeah, this is a lot easier to deal with, you know what I mean? So what was the day like? I mean, I'm guessing you were training, like you were mm. doing some sprint training in the morning or? Um... Yeah, I think, or if I remember correctly, I just finished a, a solid session. Um, and I think we had a day off or something coming up or you know, whatever. It was, I, I remember thinking, right, yeah, that the hard kind of session out of the way. And yeah, basically, um, yeah, he, he went to go up and, visit the volcano and I said, oh, why not? What's, what's the worst that can happen? And basically <laughs> went for the ride to visit the volcano and then, <laughs> and then obviously the worst happened. Uh, well, not the worst, but yeah, pretty much near enough the worst happened. So. Yeah, I'm right. You're saying that's Mount Tady, isn't it? In Tenerife? Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. went up it myself actually a few years ago. I mean, I'm, mm. so those roads, was it one of those windy roads that, you know, you go up to, to the mountain? Because they are quite narrow, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, on the way on the way up, they were pretty wind, windy. Yeah, I mean, everything coming on the way back down, I don't really even remember to be honest. Um, but yeah, there was mountain roads. It was yeah, bends everywhere, and yeah, it was just it was just a mess. I mean, like the actual the actual crash itself. Do you remember? Was it literally just a blackout thing at the time for you? Do you remember much yeah. of that? Or yeah, no. The, the the only thing I remember is seeing headlights, um, and that was it. And then a loud bang. And then the next thing, I'm lifting my head, I'm kind of splattered on the floor in pieces. Um, that's all I really remember, to be honest. Um, everything 
kind of leading up to that was a bit of a, a bit of a blur, man. Because I'm right in saying, man, you thought your right leg was actually missing, which is crazy to think about how you were literally training in the morning and then, like, you know, by the mm. evening, you might not, you might not even have a leg. Oh yeah, I mean, I didn't think it was missing. I said, I, I said, I think I said at one point my leg's gone when I was like on the floor, but yeah, I could see like, yeah, I just see like shards of like bone coming out of my leg, um, and kind of <laughs> the angle wasn't normal where the, the, the way my leg was, so it was snapped pretty much in half, hanging. Um, so I was just like, ah, oh, my leg's gone, and I pulled. I, I pretty much thought I was gonna lose my leg. I was like, yeah, the amount of blood that's coming out and stuff. Um, I think I lost six pints of blood in total. Which you've only got eight, so yeah, it was pretty horrific. I mean, you said you you said you know like in other interviews you kind of said like you cheated death. I mean, is that a mm. fair kind of reflection on it? Um, yeah, and I saw that in the last article. Um, maybe I said that in the wrong context. I don't. I don't think you you, you can't cheat death. But when death wants to come for you, it comes for you. I mean, um, I'd like to rephrase it. I'd like to say probably. I came close to death and survived. Um, it could have gone, it could have gone left. You know what I mean? It could have could have been a lot worse. So I would never say I cheated death because you can't cheat death when it's your time. Not all of us are going to go at some point, but yeah, um, it nearly became. Um, I nearly died a lot earlier than I wanted to. <laughs> the thing is, like you were in such good form, kind of going yeah. up to that season as well, which is kind of mad thinking about it. Like, mm. how do you kind of compute that now to where you are? I know, you, you know, you, you've had a comeback, of course, in, in Worthing yeah. and, you know, Dagenham, you had 10 balls, mm. you were in 10, 60. But mm. like that, that you know, prior to your crash, your PB in the 100 was 10.04, uh, 200 mm. was 20.31. I mean, mm. like that must be kind of mad to think about how good you were then compared to kind yeah. of then the recovery stage. And then it's like you're basically starting from scratch again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was super tough. Um, because as you know, like, like you said at the beginning of the interview, um, that year I ran five PBs. I pretty much committed about the hundred, hundred meters is my event now. Um, it's not the two hundred, right? So it was like a new, new fun lease of life. Um, and training was going so well as well. Like I had pretty much, you know, the tough, the, the sport's tough, but I had loads of things lined up because every, everybody suddenly saw this new potential in my hundred meter um speed. So I had contracts on the table. I had loads of stuff. Like I was thinking, yeah, this is it. Like 2017 is going to be my year. Um, knowing that Bolt was gone as well, I was like, well, I know I can run 9-9. I, I, I know I could run a lot quicker than what I ran in the trials as well. I'd seen glimpses of it in training. Um, so in my head, I was like, yeah, 2017, home crowd, world championships, 100 metres, really like, like, you know what I mean? It was all kind of set out in my head. So for when that happened, it was just like, ah. And then obviously trying to come back from it, um, I'm at the stage I'm at now. I'm actually, I'm actually in good, good, good form. Um, my earlier races aren't probably nothing to be looked at because I've been loaded up with training. So I know the season is not what I'm trying to do. I, I mean it. I'm actually trying to come back and win the trials and beat everybody. And and I know this isn't. If you're an athlete, you know that kind of some athletes open up fast because they might be fresh, or some might might open up slow because they've been doing loads of work. But the time that I want to peak is at the trials. So, um, yeah, as much as I would like to run fast early, I know what the long-term goal is. So I'm taking these races. I'm seeing where I can get to whilst I know I'm kind of a bit heavy. And then when the time's right, then hopefully it will, um, my times will drop when it needs to. Like, how confident are you of, of doing that? I mean, what's your training like now compared to what it was pre-2017? I mean, are you doing anything yeah. different because yeah, of no, I've had, your, your body? I've or do, Yeah, I've had to do loads different. I mean, now... It's, it's a lot more, not so much volume, it's more um, quality. And I, I'm not really able to kind of get out there and hammer my body either. Um, because anytime I train really hard or intense, like my pelvis will flare up or I'll get problems, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like um, whatever training I'm doing, I have to make sure it counts. So I can't just be doing things for unnecessary reasons. Like I'm not saying I was doing things for unnecessary reasons before, but there would be a lot of repetitions or you do an extra rep when you know you're a bit smashed. Now I have to be very particular in kind of is is me doing this extra rep. What's the what, is it is the benefits going to outweigh me being off for two days in pain with my pelvis? You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, yeah, it's a fine balance now, but at the same time, I'm, I've still got it. Like um, 
I've seen it. I've seen it a few times in training and I've still got it. So, um, how do you know you yeah. got it? Is it like a mental thing or do you just kind of, is it no, how no, you feel at the time? You, or? No, you, you physically see it. I mean, I've got, I've, I've had the stopwatch on certain sessions I've done. Um, and it's the proofs in the pudding. I've, I've been, I've gone through the camera and through the lasers. So I've seen, I know, I know, I know I've been hitting sometimes. Um, so now for me, it's just kind of with the competition, just getting that balance right of actually running, well, competing when I need to compete um, and kind of the training leading into that competition, making sure it's perfect because if it's slightly off, because I'm so hypersensitive now to flaring up from pain from training or whatever the case may be, um, I just have to be very careful that I don't overdo it in the sessions leading up to a competition or, you know what I mean? It's got to be perfect. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I, I don't like compare you to Lewis Hamilton, but like Hamilton, mm. you know, like similar age to you, like he kind mm. of knows, he's been in the sport a long time, he kind of knows where he is best and where he is not best. And it, I'm getting the same vibes from you that it is like, mm. it is down to that quality of, you know, yes. you know that like if you nail a session and the session, you know, is going to benefit mm. you a lot, that's going to be better for you than it is actually doing two or three sessions, which may not improve your quality, but you think how you feel overall. Exactly. And I'm guessing that's exactly kind of what you're looking to get at, out of Tokyo against tough competition with, you know, Zarnel Hughes, Reese Prescott. Mm. I mean, you've got some tough mm. guys there to beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, um, I, I, I totally understand the kind of, um, the heights that I'm going to have to be at to beat some of these um, other athletes, but, I've never been. I've never been a person that's been deluded with kind of or having belief in something that I don't think I'm capable of. I'm kind of like, I'm I'm quite a realist. Um, and if I genuinely didn't think that I could come back and beat these guys or get to the top level, then I would have just I would have knocked it on the head. Um, I mean, obviously, when I first did it in the hospital and I'm smashed to pieces, that was more of kind of my mental and my physical, my sorry, my mental and my spirit saying that I know I can get back from it which I genuinely believed then. Um, but obviously, once I was able to start training as well, then I physically could see that, oh, actually, you know what, James? Like, despite the pain you're going through, you can still, you can still do it. So it's, it's almost like an old heavyweight boxer, like George Foreman winning the world, world title when he was like 50 or whatever it was. Like, he knew that, okay, cool, I'm, I'm, I'm old now. I'm going to have to pick my, pick my punches correctly. But I know if I hit him at the right time, now I can be a world champion again. Um, he might not have had the stamina or whatever the case may be when he was younger. It's similar to me. I'm not going to go out there and run a ton of races, do a ton of training because I know my body's going to break down because of the injuries and stuff. Um, but I know that if I pick the right races and I train correctly, you catch me on the right day, it's going to be a problem. Like going through your Insta as well, um, mm. like a lot of the uh, photos and posts you you know you do post are kind of mm. like self motivational posts. They're kind of mm. letting the world know that you know you are there, you are here, mm. you're still around, and you still want to get to the goals that you want to. And you want to yeah. make people aware of that. And like yeah. a lot of that, yeah. I guess at the start of when you were kind of recovering from the crash, alongside kind of you know the support that you had, you know from friends and family. And I think you mentioned in one interview that you had about six or seven kind of people who were really close to you who kind of really helped mm. you at that time that mm. you know and then like your profile pic is I'm right to say it's you of a kid like that little warrior yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of yeah, yeah exactly like yeah, that yeah. little that's so that mental approach at the start was mm. like right now it's physical but at the start the mental side has got you here to where you are now 100 percent. it's always been there it's like saying that same as my profile picture I've as a kid, like, I remember taking that picture and I was so serious when I was posing. <laughs> it wanted, like, in my head, I'm like, I'm the strongest little man in the world. Like, ah! like it's, it's been like that since I was a kid and it's never faded out. So some people might think I'm a, a some people might think I'm crazy or, or you're deluded or whatever, but I wouldn't have kind of got through some of the things I've got, without like sounding cliche and cool. I wouldn't have got through some of the things that I've got through had, I, had my mentality not been like that, you know what I mean? And that's including this crash. If I didn't, if I, if I, if I weren't genuine, if my spirit that I put out and showed the world wasn't a genuine thing, I would have crumbled because to be an athlete at kind of a, an elite level to, and, and to kind of lose it all, yeah, that's enough to break pretty much most people. But I've always been genuine with the way I, the way I think and the way I kind of believe. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what got me through, man. So you're quite a spiritual person anyway, or? 
I wouldn't say I would. I probably wouldn't have said before, um, but I've changed a lot during the crash since the crash and kind of had a lot of time to sit down and reflect and think about things and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I think that 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 word's been used loosely in the last couple of years by everyone. In it. Oh, spiritual. Everyone wants to be spiritual now, um, but yeah, I think I think I'm kind of in tune with certain things still. Yeah. Because I guess, like, I mean, it is Mental Health Kind of Awareness Week, and I guess there would have been times. The thing is, like, for you, especially in a race, it's not like you were a 10,000 metre runner where you got time, or a marathon runner where you got time to think yeah, about yeah. kind of races. Like, for you, it's instinctive and it's instant, which kind of, when you're laying in a hospital bed or kind of when you're struggling to walk and, like, you've got <clears> setbacks every time you take a step, you think mm. you must be thinking a lot about kind of life at that time. Um, mm. And it kind of is not instinctive and you've got a lot to kind of dwell on at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so whereas in training, it is literally like this, this is this, 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 and then you're mm. out of there. Um, mm. How was that? How was adapting to, the, to that mental side when you were kind of in hospital at that time? Yeah, it's tough. Um, again, like I said before, though, it's initially the first few weeks, four weeks, um, I can't say it weren't bad because it was bad, but that wasn't, probably the worst time it was like I said when I got back home afterwards and then all day every day for god knows however long I'm kind of just sitting there in a wheelchair I can't really do nothing for myself that's when you got a lot of time to be in your own mind um and that's I think uh, until somebody's kind of been at that, at that kind of to those lows you don't really know who you are as a person in it like everyone likes to portray like their some type of person because obviously everybody's got an ego to some point to, to some point or another but when you're really kind of at your lowest that's when you really discover that who you are as a person um, and luckily for me when I was in that situation the person I always kind of believed I was I found out I was that person so not that it wasn't hard it was very hard but um, what kind of person to... was that what kind of person was that then just hard 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 resilient stubborn person it's like I was not there was no way that people say oh was there not a point at any was there any point when you kind of thought to yourself oh you know what just give up this is like too hard no there wasn't to be honest there was there was points when I was thinking oh can I do this um but I'm going to try it regardless but there wasn't no oh I'm going to give up that that didn't creep in once I think if I let that creep in um I think that's I think I was on the brink for so long of just that was kind of keeping me alive. If I let that go, everything could have just spiraled out of control, you know what I mean? So I was aware, right? Let me just no, I wanna I wanna come back from this, I'm gonna come back from this. Um and slowly but surely I managed to to hit little goals and start building back. Because I guess that must have come from your upbringing, like growing up. And you talk so, about yeah. like the world champs in 2017. Mm. I mean, you know knew him quite well. Like you grew mm. up in, you know, you're born in Lewisham, weren't you? So, mm. yeah, um, yeah. like that area is all fairly similar to mm. you. So it was kind mm. of, I'm guessing, you know, when you, I mean, you said you lost six pints of blood well, out of eight pints. Mm. I mean, yeah. for, for most people, <laughs> like if you say that to most people, they're thinking, how the hell are you still here? Like, yeah, no. Did, was, scientifically, was, uh... did you know how that was the case? How you kind of got through that? Not really. Um because at the time I, I knew I needed a blood transfusion because doctors were running around like crazy people um, but I didn't know how serious it was even with my leg I wasn't I thought I'd lose a leg initially when I crashed but then once I was in the hospital I kind of thought oh maybe it's safe but to my knowledge I, I didn't realise that they was actually thinking right this, he's probably going to lose his leg still so everyone's running around crazy um, I'm just wondering right why am I feeling so like I was lifting my head off the bed literally as soon as I lifted my head I felt like I'd done 10 three hundreds flat out I was like Pfft. I had to put my head back. I was thinking, what is going on here? But it's obviously because I'd lost six pints of blood. I was smashed to pieces. My body's obviously fighting for survival, trying to like keep me alive. And I'm thinking, oh my, like, you really you think to yourself, right? You don't think it's, you, you'd ever be in that position because you're a physically strong athlete. But yeah, it was a different experience, man. It was crazy. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I guess, you know, you've won major medals in pretty much all, you know, well, and in fact, all team events, you know, four by 100s, mm. you know, World Relays, Bahamas mm. 2014, you know, mm. two European golds in the four by one, mm. and then Commonwealth, Glasgow in 2014, 
uh, mm. silver in the four by one. You know, you've mm. kind of always had that kind of team ethos and team spirit. Like, how yeah. how did you see that kind of when you were kind of recovering as well? Um, because the, mm. the, the amount of messages you got, even on like your Instagram on that post, you got like 500 odd messages from like mm. everyone in athletics, but also people kind of, it kind of transcended mm. sport in a way, doesn't it as well? Yeah, um, it was good. And it, was imp- it was good and it was important because it keeps you kind of going. Um, but the whole team thing, like, again, it, initially it's like, and I, and I understand because it's just human nature, when something is new and fresh, everyone's on it. You know what I mean? So when I crashed, everyone's like, wants to visit, and like, it's non-stop. Um, but the time when I probably needed people the most was the time when I was at hospital. And that's when you kind of realise that, oh, actually, yeah, like, you, you put an Instagram post up, and maybe that, maybe Instagram saved my life, because maybe that's where I was getting my little kind of saviour from, because I put the post up, and people will comment, and, and I'll be like, cool, that's good. Like, it makes you feel good, like, oh, people are supporting. But personally... I didn't really receive many messages or phone calls directly to me with people in the sport that I thought would, you know what I mean? Like, if I'm being totally honest. Like, really? Um, yeah, like, there was, there was, there was it's funny because it was, it was surprising because there was certain people in the sport that I wouldn't have expected to reach out directly or personally because I, I weren't really close with them like that in the sport. And they were kind of more the ones that reached out to me personally and weren't just about social media or whatever, do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, like, it's kind of, it's good as well because when you yeah, when you're down in that when you're down in that sort of position, you kind of see who really cares and looks out for you. You know what I mean? So yeah, hundred percent. I guess that that changes your perception of people, doesn't it? Like yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I've always been kind of shielded and guarded because just because the way I grew up with people. But yeah, like you kind of sometimes you put yourself into you get yourself into kind of full sense of security and you believe certain certain people or crowds are like your actual you know what I mean your actual mates and you're like bro oh, yeah and then you'd be willing to do things or help them out if there's a situation and maybe that's my fault because I shouldn't put I shouldn't put my expectations on other people but just when you're in that situation and you kind of think bro oh, like I thought so and so would reach out to me at least or I ain't yeah, yeah. this person do you know what I mean like, it's kind of yeah, yeah. I mean, you say you're like shielded from your upbringing. Um, mm. Are you right to talk about that? I mean, like yeah, yeah, yeah. There... When I say when I say that, I just say that kind of, um, kind of growing up where I grew up, um, it's kind of like everyone's in survival mode. So you kind of, it's not like, and when everyone is in survival mode, you just have to kind of be aware because everyone's trying to is out for themselves, really, isn't it? You know what I mean? So you got to be aware that some people might not be your friend really because they're trying to get something out of you or whatever the case may be. So you just kind of, I think just, it's just like, yeah, any, any kind of rougher kind of upbringing, you see it in movies all the time. Everyone's just got, they, they got their wits about them a bit more because mm. you're kind of in the jungle. Do you know what I mean? If I, if I grew up in like Primrose Hill or something where everyone's kind of nice and no one's in survival mode, you don't really have to watch over your shoulder for people because nobody's hungry. Do you know what I mean? But when you kind of, you're in a rougher kind of upbringing. You see, you see and hear uh, like things that are just like rah. So it just automatically you're kind of like on defensive all the time. You know what I mean? Is that what kind of got you into athletics in a way? Because it was like potentially, mm-hmm. you know, if you were kind of the fastest kid at school or the fastest mm-hmm. kids kind of around, then you'd be the popular mm-hmm. kid. Was that kind of where it came um, through? Or no, you know, it wasn't even about that for me. It was, do you know, it was like something that I was good at and I enjoyed winning. Like if I'm being honest, I like. I was always fast. I love sports day. Um, and it was just, yeah, I just enjoyed it. I mean, when I first went to my national indoors and I won, and I was like, right, I'm like national champion. That's sick. Like, it was, it was that feeling when you're a kid of winning something. Do you know what I mean? So I was like, right, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep that. I'm going to keep doing this because it's a good feeling when you win. That was, that was for me what got me into athletics. It weren't about that kind of trying to be pop. Actually, if anything, being, doing, doing athletics from where I'm from, would make you more it make you unpopular I oh, really <laughs> people, yeah people were like right, what's this nerd doing like when one's going to athletics and stuff like that do you know what I mean so but I, I never cared about what people think I was for me I was like yeah I like it because I win and I, and as I got older the same people that I grew up with that when we were kids do you know what I mean so um, that's where yeah. it came from I, I guess kind of finishing off then looking ahead to to Tokyo like 
mm. I mentioned about the training at the start. I mean, you're in, you're mm. in Italy at the minute. Um, you know, you're based mm. in Dubai. You said, um, is that a new <clears> thing? <throat> is that just where you think yeah, no, where the training camp is a good good idea? Yeah, I was based in Dubai because my wife she uh, she got a job out there in, in uh, 2019. So obviously, me being an athlete, I'm not really tied to a workplace. You know what I mean? So, and it just worked out perfectly because it's obviously hot out there. Um, so just made sense and like Italy is that a kind of similar thing you just got really good facilities out oh, there no. and yeah no the, the reason the reason why I'm here is just for the race because I'm racing tomorrow so oh, okay. I came out I came out a week I think I came out a week earlier um, because I was staying with a couple of other athletes that I know out here um, stayed with them done some training and then yeah and it tied in well with the competition so it just made sense Are you confident of, of the race yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm confident. I'm confident. We'll see how my body holds up tomorrow, but I'm mentally I'm confident right now. I feel good. I feel a lot better than flipping Worming, put it that way. <laughs> no, to be fair, like I guess it gets to the just the issue though. I mean it's literally like Stagan and Worthing, and then you had the uh, the Muller champs at the anniversary games 2019. Mm. And that's literally mm. it for, since mm. 2016. I mean, yeah. it's not a lot of match fitness, I guess, to kind of No, to, it's not. Go that it's not. Yeah, it's not. It's not. I need to get that balance right as well because because I know what I'm, I'm capable of. I know what I've been doing in training. I just want to automatically get back into right, bam, and just. But I, I need to understand as well, which a couple of other athletes have said, like James, you've been off for like four years, bro. But you're not going to suddenly just get straight back into racing and be running ten hours straight away. You know what I mean? But in my mind, I'm like, why not? Like, of course I can. This is like I've seen it in training, and I, I, I can do that. So. Yeah, I'm, I just need to balance it. I understand that, but I think tomorrow, I think tomorrow I'm good. I guess moving forward, like, you know, the championships, you know, are like an Olympics or championships are different because you've got the heats, you've got, you know, the semis, then you've got the finals. It's like a stage process, mm. whereas like a Diamond mm. League is, or like a, a normal race is just one event. I mean, have you mm. thought about balancing that up in your head potentially of how that Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I mean, that's been an issue in my head actually because, like I said, I'll do hard training sessions and I might be, that messed up for like 24 hours um and i've seen it in training a couple of times where i've done fast fast reps and then like right well, that's it now so tomorrow will be interesting because i've got two races so that will kind of show me like can i really can i race back to back can i put a fast time down go away for an hour and come back and the body's gonna respond well so i fall by a lot but tomorrow will be the kind of test for that so Cool. Mate, final thing for me. I mean, I mentioned at the site it's Mental Health Awareness Week. I mean, your mm. journey kind of epitomizes, especially in athletics, kind of yeah. that, you know, journey from, you know, doing really well, then you've got a massive setback in life. And then now you're kind of trying to get back to where you were, even better to where you were before, using what you had mm. as, a, as a downside, as an upside. I mean, like, if you've got a message for anyone who's, who's struggling out there or, you know, mm. who's been through something similar to you, what would that mm. message be? I'd say the message for me would be to kind of, I know it's easier said than done. I've been there, innit? But just try and take the positives out of your situation because there's always a silver lining. I'm, it's easy. It's, it's the easier thing to either quit or to look at the negatives or to dwell on the bad stuff. Um, but for me, the thing that helped me go, get through was just kind of appreciate the good stuff. So I'm alive. I'm healthy relatively I've got good people around so try and, and not and not to be quiet as well like I know some people haven't got anybody around them but even just ringing a helpline or whatever the case may be if you need to speak to someone you need to speak to someone you know? 